people, some here in Maine, some all around the country, um, developing this here uh, advanced science plan for NASA's ocean biology and biogeochemistry research. This is actually online and open for comments. So maybe, you know, some fireside night, Emmanuel can make you guys sit down and give some comments as the future of our field, whether uh, we've done a good job. So this is a letter from Paula Bontempi, who chairs uh, ocean biology and biogeochemistry. Is she coming up this year? She is not. Um, but here's the table of contents. So we sort of divided the science questions into sort of four um, larger topics. So one is expansive ecosystems, so understanding the ocean ecosystems. One is called life on the edge, and you're like, huh, what? What is that? Because we're all living a life on the edge, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Especially <laughs> when you're thrown in front. No, uh, so this is kind of interesting. So people in the snow community and vegetation know when you have a boundary habitat, so ice edge, continental edge, you need sort of different types of sensing and different types of technology uh, to, to look at boundaries um, often and the way to sense them. And so this is kind of uh, how we characterize some of the coastal issues, some of the sea ice to land and margins that are shifting. Um, and then we have sort of what you guys will probably spend a bit of time, ocean biogeochemistry. So that's elemental cycling um, and how that relates to climate, such as carbon dioxide and other nutrients. And then the last one we sort of barely get into. And I, if I have time during my lecture today, since I seem to be the only one that uh, I, I end up writing that section a lot, um, transient threats and disasters. And I'm going to show you the ocean community really is pretty behind the ball. If you look at any of NASA's ocean threats and disasters, it's barely, their ocean is like, where is the ocean? It's like fires, even floods, coastal floods, we don't do anything with. It's all the veg people doing these simple indices of, water and NDVI and there's this is must be water surface so they map it but they don't do sediments in it they don't do pollutants they don't do anything um, and we haven't had the Goldilocks set of conditions where we can get really real-time monitoring at the right spatial scales so and often from a satellite it's hard to do because um, we have one kilometer pixels at high sp spectral resolution or we get a small pixel, but we only get three channels. How many of you are Landsat? I met some Landsat people, right? So there's no like perfect temporal. Temporal is crazy, right? So we don't get the frequency, and then we have clouds. So it's a harder problem, but I do think there's a lot of potential for growth there. So then we have observational strategies, which I know some of you are working on the LIDARs. Um, Geostationary, which is our attempt to sort of get uh, the temporal resolution. Now, when I don't know if you guys will learn orbits, but you know, to get a geostationary has to be very far out, and to get a really high spatial resolution, you would need a telescope the size of, you know, this campus, right? So, um, generally, it has a less spatial resolution than you'd like to look at, say, a coastal habitat. But we're working as a community um, to try to come up with ideas uh, to get a sequence of sensors. So the second one, the third one here is combined high spatial, high spectral, high temporal, and high signal to noise observations, right? Because that's probably what we would really need to do a lot of the work we want to do in these boundary habitats. Um, but wow, I mean, that's a a tall order, right? As you guys will learn um, going forward, how to, how to get all of that is not going to be likely one, one asset, but maybe collections and data merging and such. Um, and then a, a few of you, um, Stacy and myself are part of Coral and some others where we have portable sensors on aircraft, 
which you can fly um, and get high spatial resolution and theoretically, if you needed to, high temporal. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff we know we need along with it, field data, modeling, and analysis. So I, I recommend you guys take a look. Um, here are the main four science questions. What processes drive change in ecosystem structure and biodiversity? And how do contemporary changes in these globally expansive ecosystems inform improved man management practices? What you can read that. Anyhow, diversity, function of aquatic boundary habitats, carbon and el elemental transitions, and knowledge of the spatial extent, dispersion, intensity, and frequency of hazards and disasters. Um, so those are kind of the four themes. But if you guys find that you think there should be other ones or there's something you like that can't be under this umbrella, you know, write a little comment because this is the future for the next 10 years, right? So when you guys are done, these are going to be the solicitations that come out from NASA. Um, and so it's a worthy exercise to spend a little time looking at what, what the plan is. Um, so we did add a section called benefits to the nation just because you know you don't want this to be just uh, you, a little bit of applied why do we care about aquatic ecosystems um, and truthfully no one likes to put a number on what is this habitat worth right but we're being asked more and more to do that so any of you have economic thoughts it's a Putting numbers on in dollars is, is sort of important to get our science forward, and it's not something that a lot of people feel comfortable with. But if you feel like that's something you have within you that you like to do, I know I've talked with Paula Bontempi and others, we, we, uh, the IOCCG, it's something that's going to have to be done, like what is the worth of ocean color observation. So if any of you bright minds feel motivated and have that background or want to start taking some economics of environmental systems, we're going to have to go forward and make some estimates of what it's worth and what can be done with our observations uh, economically. Okay, so just a plug, I will give you where the website is and please you know, spend a little time because this is your future. That we want to make sure has your brightest, coolest, most outrageous ideas. So what we did also add in this plan was um, underwater observations, right? So um, usually that's a NOAA Navy thing, but doing uh, ROVs, AUVs, underwater, um, tethered and untethered autonomous and not really manned, just mostly autonomous systems to look at sea floors, to look at deep sea habitats, because NASA also wants to go explore other worlds and moons, and gee, it would be a shame if we didn't have ocean color people that could say, oh, is there liquid under that ice? Well, we know how to get some fluorescence and sediments and look for life and stuff, because that's also something, if we just stay in our little bubble, then we'll have someone else be doing these imaging and ocean color stuff for other worlds, right? And I'd like to see some of you guys do that. So um, we did include that uh, in one of the sections on portable sensors. So the portables include portable sensors and satellites, suborbital on the, on the sea and below the sea. So just keep that in mind. Um, let me see if I can find my presentation because I'm super prepared. Um, advanced plan. Here it is. All right. So what I'm going to talk a little bit is some out-of-the-box things. So now we're putting up hyperspectral. There's a ton of work on what we can do using that. And in particular, I'm going to my lab's been working on a lot of these, what I would call, oh, wow, that had a voice on it. So I'll just keep it in this mode. 
Um, <laughs> so here's white caps, sea ice, floating vegetation, floating plastics and other debris. We have things we don't often look at, bubbles, uh, dense blooms we're starting to do, but none of our current assets have the channels that we can do this super well. Calcite, you guys are uh, probably going to learn a little bit about certain types of uh, highly scattering. When I call bright water, these are sort of highly scattering. Sometimes sediments at the sea surface, and then the sea floor can be in bright water, sands and other things can actually also influence. Um, as we move forward, some of these areas get masked out in the current imagery. Some of these things look like clouds. They get masked out in the clouds. Some of them get removed with aerosols, and you're going to learn one atmosphere correction 101 from Jeremy today. Um, so a lot of these things, if you're working in these areas, you're going to have to be a super user. You can't just take down a remote sensing reflectance product and assume it works. Um, because most of our current approaches are designed for out there in the open ocean when things co-vary, there's not surface scum, there's not stuff that, that all gets considered to be bright water. So I'm gonna, Colin wanted me to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing for PACE, which is on uh, white caps and foam. Has anybody, I know this is a stretch, seen a white cap? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a few of them. Anybody get seasick like me? It's not an easy thing to study, right? So on the big open ocean, they often don't even let you put your instruments in the water when it's really rough. So uh, you have to have it either strapped on, and Colin and I were part of a cruise where they called, and they're like, yeah, it's going to be so bad, your front bow-mounted sensors are going to probably get destroyed because the waves, it's so rough um, that they're going to get destroyed. So it is like the world's hardest thing to do from a ship because everyone is sick and the, the, the boats get hammered and you can't put things in very easily in the water. Um, so why, why did we study white caps? Anybody? See that you can see that's coming next. <laughs> what do you think? Um, because they, they, um, they're cool. They're cool, <laughs> and um, they really change your. You can your surf water them. Using. They do. So that's a good point. So they're like a. We call them a contamination, and and you'll see Jeremy will give a like probably one slide to this horrible contamination we call white caps. Ken Voss in the back has done some very nice work on white caps as well. Um, what else? Do we, anybody? So it's a horrible contamination. It's a white feature on a very dark ocean, you know, the ocean being quite dark. So if you guys were, if I was talking to a room of not ocean optics people, because most people don't do ocean optics, right? They'd be like, of course, it's air-sea gas exchange. I mean, this is the main driver is white caps. So air-sea flux. So it creates aerosols. So most of the aerosols in the open ocean are from sea spray, right? Which is a process that comes from turbulence at the sea surface. Um, white caps uh, enhancement of air-sea gas exchange, gas and heat transfer and the production of aerosols. So really, I mean, we've been throwing away this white signal because we think it's contamination, but our contamination is somebody else's gold mine, right? So really, you, when you start doing these things, you can start thinking about my, my detritus bucket is somebody else's, you know, pot of gold, pot of gold right? Um, so one of my thoughts is, can we do white caps which we think is like a problem and contributes in ways that we don't like. Um, so let's just take a look at where aerosols go. Um, if I could, I could probably, oh, I could kill sound. That would be the smart thing. Well, we can play that game. <laughs> <laughs> so
So here's where white caps matter. You guys are in Maine, I, so I, I, you've seen a few up here, but obviously in the poles, the winds blow. And then look at this whole Southern Ocean, which we don't remotely sense well anyways, has a, uh, this is a white cap fraction, which is the fraction of the sea surface that we estimate covered by white caps. So when I was saying that Colin and I did this cruise going down, we were going straight here. Those of you who've been across the Drake Passage, which it did for my dissertation, know it's pretty, uh, pretty big problem there, right? Um, so we have this a stage A and stage B, which one is a breaking wave manifestation and the other is foam and bubbles. Now, when you put a package in the water, like to measure backscattering, right? Do you get bubbles or do you not? Yes, yes. Do you, you do get bubbles. Yeah. The <laughs> They're sort of considered another thing, an enemy, right? But you have to realize that when we were looking at ocean color, we tend to remove the bubbles with the atmosphere correction as part of this white cap wave aerosol part. And then we go and we put a backscattering device in the water and well, there's real bubbles there, right? So um, another source of error or source of opportunity because uh, bubbles also uh, serve to enhance air-sea gas exchange. They're important for ejecting atmospheric bubbles, supersaturating the water with gases. So um, kind of can be measured, but, you know, in the past, people do it with just a visual or like a, image analysis that says, okay, I can crop. And in fact, I have lunch with Ed Monahan, who did a lot of the initial white cap work. And uh, you see this kind of picture. So in the old days, how did they estimate the fraction of white caps before they had computers? Visually, they did visually, but you know, literally they would weigh the paper and then they'd cut out the white caps and then they'd reweigh the white caps and that's how they did it. So, you know, when, when we get lose our electricity, you guys might just get a balance and a, a little. So, no, the old days, that's what they did. So, but it's still the same thing that we do. We just have image analysis software tools. But the truth is there's more enhancements than you would see visually in a picture. So. One of my students, Kate, looked at the Southern Ocean, um, and much of the bubble impact at stage B is missed from your visual assessments. But we, you can see it with a radiometer because you know the background, you know this waves come over, and you know how long it can stay elevated, right? So these are things that we haven't used radiometers to do, but actually people from the Air-Sea Exchange, I'm part of this project, Orcus, um, they talk all the time about ocean processes and they never talk to an oceanographer. It's like we, we sample the air and we go over plumes and then we model what the ocean was doing and we estimate what the flux of carbon is in and out. I mean, they are talking now, but essentially it's another area that we can go into. So this is an equation that uh, you guys will see more of. Have you seen this yet so far? Right. So I'm just warming you up. So this is what we see, right? And then this is what you guys care about in most of this class. And then all the rest of this is stuff we throw out. Um, this is foam and white caps. This is sun glint. And this is aerosols. And presently, these two kind of go hand in hand. So the aerosol people think we don't do aerosols well. The only thing is that we don't really want to do aerosols. We do aerosols plus air from foam and white caps, and we throw that into our aerosol pool. Um, we also throw a lot of data out from sun glint, and sometimes I think that's a little extreme because there's times when, when maybe we can get a good signal. Um, but it, for ease and consistency, we've been losing a lot of pixels. Um, so here's the current approach. So when you get your data, <clears throat> basically we say all white caps are 22% reflective. 
So they're pretty bright, right? 100% would be bright white, so they're like a nice solid gray. Pretty bright considering what percent the ocean surface is, which is what, like point, point one, point six, you know, reflective. Uh, so we have these bright, bright manifestations. We use some wind speed to white cap relationship. Um, and I have no idea, so this is a, like my other warning part too, is you're going to go out and collect data under a set of conditions, and then you'll come up with a parameterization, and then it'll go to conditions on the other ends of where you measured, and if you haven't looked at how it performs out there, it may be kind of a overestimate. So um, these are different formulations. Somehow this black one that goes skyrocketing up is the one NASA chooses. So they recognize that this skyrocketing white cap fraction with wind speed uh, is way, way too high. So then they say, at this point, we level it out. We, we're not going to follow this relationship anymore. Uh, this is the relationship. Um, how it looks. So this is the Stromska, which was measured under these conditions, which was kind of good. But you know, you saw those southern oceans, they get to these conditions, and this is what that relationship. So obviously NASA said at this point we're going to level it out and assume that there's no more white cap fractions. Yes. It was Sean. He was. <laughs> Not much. Yeah. That's what you say, but I've been out there, and it's blown with clear skies. And I make a note of it in my little Sean Bailey notebook. <laughs> I was just in Hawaii. We just had Hispery. It was blowing like crazy. Sunniest skies. I mean, who is Hispery? Uh, Kelly. Was it, there was a lot of sunny skies, and it was like windy like crazy for the first week. I'm just... I'm just saying it happens. But I get your point, because their average wind speeds are also biased on how we ca estimate those. And so I was just going to congratulate you, because we recognize this is actually pretty not a horrible, a horrible spot. So this is probably the latest, greatest average that just came out in 2017, is this blue one from all the polar seas. So Sean, I, as I said at one of my talks, I'm like, NASA knew this well before because our optics data would not, this cubic, this cubic relationship wouldn't actually work with the optics data we collect. So in a way we sort of said we know they can't be that many white caps. In fact, there's very seldom 10%. It's like 8% is about as high as you can see. I'll show you that right here. So the irony is these are all the data points that have been heavily massaged. The blue are from the Southern Ocean, and these pinks are from High Wings, which is near the Greenland, so both the poles. This is a paper uh, by Broomer. So you can see that sometimes you can have high winds, and no wolf, sometimes very high winds, and still low, and sometimes very high. And on average, we put this relationship on it, and come up with an estimate for white caps. Um, so what else does, white caps can't be fully predicted by wind speed. Why not? The wind blows. What else is happening? Yeah, I don't know. So the thing is, white caps are air pressure, swells, currents, directions, the whole uh, fetch the area over which the wind blows. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that kind of determine whether the ocean white caps. So wind speed is the main predictor, but it's even if you look at all these little data points, you're never going to exactly know 
how much of the sea surface is covered by white caps. Um, but this new relationship, because no one really went to sea at 20 meters per second, like Sean said, that's, this is like wickedly rough. We're finally getting points out here, and the relationship is actually flattening out. Um, and this is no longer a cubic, it's a 1.7 relationship. But just to put on, this is what NASA currently uses. So, you know, we could think about as a first level, perhaps, you know, making it a little more realistic, not skyrocketing like this, um, using some of these new data. Um, so what about the white cap reflectance? Are all white caps 22% and then decaying into the near infrared? So this is wavelength. But as you might see in some of my plots, there are microns. So this is the visible, and then this is the near infrared, and then going out into the short wave. Um, so over the visible, you know, they're sort of flat, um, but then they decay. Um, so this is the t white caps that were done in 1984 in a very nice study. Um, and it's what we use. We assume, whoop, we assume 22%. Um, but you can see that's, even with your eye, to assume that there's one level of white cap when you have a white and now it's like a little more gray and then you have bubble plumes. Um, it's also hard to assign a value and a spectral shape to a white cap. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, in fact, there is. Um, they, they tend to stabilize bubbles when there's a lot of CDOM, and they last a lot longer. And they actually, we have a paper that they're much smaller than they hypothetically could be. So if you just had an air bubble at two microns, it'll pop, essentially, the pressure. But if it's stabilized by organics, they can last and be a lot smaller. Um, so it is a relationship that also determines not only the color of the foam, because you guys have all seen like brown foams. Um, and then it also determines how long they last and how many micro bubbles are in the water. So how we measure that is actually with, and I don't have time to talk about it today, but if anybody's interested, um, we had during some of these studies a volume scattering. Do you guys know the full volume scattering? Um, did you talk about critical angle scattering? Yeah, a little bit. So. In general, so um, there's a portion. So when what light enters, goes between water and air, it refracts, right? So same thing when it in goes into a bubble. So it's going to create bending, and it creates a scattering little bump um, in the forward lobe of the volume scattering function um, that you can see, and you know that light has bent into air and come back. Um, and so you know they're air-filled bubbles, which is kind of cool. Um, so uh, uh, we've been using that. And there's several researchers, Mike Tordowski and uh, Zhao Dong Zhang, who do, we have some inversions. And you can estimate the fraction of your particles from the volume scattering function. So we're hoping that some of the optical techniques we're pushing to the limits. And we can couple it with a list that gives us background, and then enhanced particles. You guys doing lists, too? Yeah. So um, you might see that in your signal. So um, sorry, did I? So here's some of the uh, data. I was hoping to show you one more plot, but um, that background there is black. The black lines are some of the measurements made in the past for spectral. And there's only a few that go really beyond this one micron. And they were made in a bucket by Whitlock. Um, I'll try to find the actual slide on that. Um, 
And then these are Fruen who made it in very dense surf breaking zone. And Moore made some other measurements as well that I have on a different plot. Um, but now that we're getting hyperspectral going out, you can see these are some of the full spectral measurements made of white caps. Uh, there's a lot of like a lot more structure. So what's going on? All right. Kurt, is this supposed to come on? Oh, I just blinded some people, fortunately. Laser surgery. Uh, okay, so uh, they're differently colored depending on the water colors. We have to do a lot of our work in Long Island Sound, which is quite green-brown. Um, but there's also dips and wiggles that we have to take into account when we start thinking about um, hyperspectral data, and some of these for white caps um, are due to different absorption features in the near infrared of subtle things. So if you look at this, it's, these are some mixed pixels here, uh, and these are some of the bright manifestations of waves. Here is water, um, the real and imaginary index of refraction, going from 400 to 700. So your plots when you look at water absorption kind of stopped here. You guys all know AW, right? This is ice in white, so it's similar but a little different. And then as you go into the near infrared, it's kind of cool. You see these little bumps. These are weak water absorption features due to the vibrational. Um, and what you can see is these little features that have enhanced absorption actually create dips in your spectrum. So um, these actual features are produced because as the light gets into the white cap, it gets multiply scattered and the liquid water in these little features um, create these dips. And if you could see that, it's, uh, let me just show you that. Pretty big, yeah. But what it turns out, um, they're weakly absorbing, which means they use them on the terrestrial systems for drought and plants, right? Because if it was truly a strong feature, you wouldn't get any light coming back because the, it would be absorbed by a plant. Or, but the idea is these features. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, can be observed in our signal. So as we start moving further and further out, it's kind of cool. So we're starting to see some of these unique water features. Now you'll see this in floating vegetation. So we used some of this signal here at 980, which is commonly used for plants. We could actually uh, estimate the age of floating racks of seagrass because as they age, they became more and more waterlogged until eventually they sank. So if you want to look at floating things on the sea surface, you know, these are just features you might think about for your studies. Um, if we can, we, we don't have 980, we have 940, which is water vapor absorption, um, but it's close. Um, and you can possibly use some of that um, in the future. And if we go hyperspectral, um, like from PRISM and other aircraft. So my idea is I wonder if it's a more turbulent wave, creates more absorption at this feature because it's a breaking wave. You'll get a bigger dip. Oh, sorry, this is a little out of order. I was going to reorder it this morning. Um, let me go back. Uh, so maybe there's something about the white cap spectrum that's actually specific to the level of breaking rather than saying all white caps are 22% and they're related to wind, which I just think I showed you isn't the most ideal approximation. Maybe we can use the spectrum we actually measure in something physical about the feature of a breaking wave, meaning 
as it's going, that liquid water is absorbing, and you're seeing, and you can kind of see it with your eye, this big dip here, and it gets less and less and less as you get more mixed pixels and smaller waves. And um, So it's one of the areas that we're working on right now is maybe there's something in a white cap that's specific to a white cap, and it's not just white. But a lot of these features are going into the near infrared. Um, sorry, this was the plot initially I wanted to show you that just showed the past studies have all been multi-spectral and not, and we've actually selected bands that sort of often don't have absorption features. When we picked where we chose our multi-spectral bands, we usually don't want gases and other atmospheric things, water, water vapor. So unless we're using it for atmospheric correction, we we sort of, if you look at some of the dips and wiggles, even in this spectrum here, we often don't put bands where we think there's atmospheric gases. But now that we're hyperspectral, we have to deal with those things in a very real way. So um, there's, these are just some algorithms for estimating the brightness of the white cap based on that dip feature at 980 I showed you. Um, and across a wide range of mixed pixels with very um, dark features to pretty bright manifestations of a very dense multi-layer wave. Um, we're getting a pretty nice regression um, just looking at that water absorption feature. Um, not so much if you look at 810. And so if you have hyperspectral data, how many of you are MATLABers? You guys are all going to be MATLABers, right? So one way you can say, OK, should you just pick one regression, two bands, right? So you might see more and more of these kinds of plots here. So if you guys want some code, I mean, it's very simple to do. You regress every wavelength. You can use a line height algorithm, which is a subtraction. You can do an NDVI, which is a subtraction over an addition. Um, and then you regress every wavelength with every other wavelength, and then you create like a heat map. And the color is the R squared. So it's just another way to just sort of look at what might be highly correlated in a data set when you have hundreds of bands rather than just six. So you can see there was no, uh, re no major patterns in the visible, but when we got to, um, 980s, these are these features here, um, highly correlated when you regress them um, to each other, both here and you can sort of see it here. Um, there's also some other ones with visible, but I'm trying to not use visible to estimate visible um, because what we're trying to do is say, can we take a dip? in the near infrared and estimate how bright the white cap is in the visible, because then you could actually remove that signal. So anyway, something in progress. And then the last part is, well, yeah, it's great. You see that at the sea service. But could you even see that up at a satellite? So you guys are going to do atmosphere correction with Jeremy. But like I just said, water vapor absorbs at 940. And here's 900 to 940. Um, this is top of the atmosphere. So I said, I don't know, like, will it get completely destroyed? I can come up with this great algorithm. We could use it from a ship, maybe a low-flying aircraft. But when you have an atmosphere filled with water vapor and other things, would such a signal be visible? So this is our first modeling attempt with Penguin Xi um, and Bo Kai Gao, uh, where we put a white cap, a high white cap, uh, which is this red one and a calm, and this is that feature at 980, modeled from the sea surface through an um, through a atmosphere. And at around 980, you can see that there's a measurable difference that this 980 band uh, has reduced this signal uh, from a calm water signal. Um, so I think it is possible. It's not possible at 940 that the wa water vapor absorbs almost everything there, but it is possible 
going towards the near infrared. All right. And I just want to point out white targets. Um, I just showed you some white cap spectra, uh, which 960 or 980 here. And then this is a cloud. So we don't often look at spectra here. And this is sea ice. It has a little enhancement um, for various reasons, because actually snow can be greater than one because of the crystalline structure. And you can get more light reflected than a flat spectral on. Uh, but what I want to point out is this is the, the absorption feature I showed you if it was in fact water in the solid phase, ice. This is what it looks like in water in the vapor phase, water vapor, like a cloud. And these are features that have liquid water, uh, 960, 980 kind of this broad absorption peak here. So really, these little shifts is how they do like ice and snow features. And they can tell how much is liquid water in the, in the snow versus how much is, is um, ice in the solid. So when you want to know if snow melts. But we can start to use some of these features as well in some of our research. So I'm just. So be familiar with other communities and can make you kind of come up with ideas. This feature also used for drought, vegetation, water absorption, and age of seagrass rack, uh, stuff like that. So um, just thinking outside some of the outside the box applications. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because do you know how a, a, it's a measurement artifact that this isn't true? This is Lambertian equivalent reflectance. So if you add a plaque and it's flat and the sun has a certain angularity to it, you measure reflectance. And then you measure the reflectance of the snow. And because of the way the light reflects inside these crystalline structures, you can actually get more light reflected back at your detector than with a flat black. Um, so if you look at like, you know, light coming in and out, like um, sort of like a, a reflector, you can get that if I, I drew it sideways like a headlight, but you wouldn't get that on that. Uh, you can get if it's really clean snow, but this is probably an artifact of the measurement. So I've been meaning to change that plot, but it is possible in the snow community when they do Lambertian equivalent, they can have greater than one in the visible, um, and it's just because it's a crystalline structure. I don't know. Can you? Right. Come down, straight up. Yeah. Back straight out like a headlight. So, so this is the snow surface, and it's coming. You get more reflecting out because it's coming off of this straight up versus a plaque where it comes in and scatters. Yeah, it is kind of cool, though, because we don't often see that in the ocean. Um, but we can see it in benthic targets, like Stacy. I mean, when you're doing benthic reflectance, if you have a really white crystalline sand, but most of our sands are not Lambertian white, but it is possible. Um, OK, so let me just, OK, so we're also doing some plastics work. Um, and we've measured natural plastics. And so plastics have some unique little dips and features. And this, this is our mean. Paper is just about to be, uh, well, it's in second review. So hopefully uh, out soon, my postdoc, Shungu, and I have been working on uh, the full spectrum, wavelength and nanometers, of different microplastics. And then the background here is the atmosphere, which you're going to learn about. Um, transmittance. So similarly, 
this little dip of microplastics at 930 is not going to be visible because we have water vapor at 940. Uh, but this little dip at 1215 is the, the atmosphere is fairly uh, transmissive there. So uh, we might be able to see this feature, certainly not this one, um, but this 1732. So we're also looking at developing sensors um, that could look in the near infrared. This was just out on the NASA website, uh, the remote paradise with a plastic problem. Um, and we're going to try to look at some further imagery there. Oh, let me see. I'm running out of time. Oh, okay. Number two, I would mention that was a graduate of this class. He is, yes. Yes, both of them were graduates of this class. And the cool thing is now, based on some of this work, they flew an aircraft with um, infrared. And if I have time to show you tonight, if Shingo sends me, um, they flew a near-infrared hyperspectral sensor over the great garbage patch in the Pacific that he's looking at now and finding some of these unique plastic identifying features. So we've been kind of uh, preparing a database of everything and where you saw white caps were 960, 980, um, where we can find some unique features. So right now we throw out everything that's bright in the aerosol pool uh, if there's some stuff that we can actually identify with certain, um, certain types of uh, floating features. So uh, he's been mapping some of that, those plastics from this aircraft um, that's near infrared hyperspectral. So if we decide as a community that, you know, maybe we should be running near infrared. Well, we just talk about color, but... You know, maybe we should make hyperspectral and look at, make a plastics mission or a CubeSat that does that or, you know, um, so these are outside the box. So these are one paper that I worked on recently um, and these were big racks of seagrass and as I said, as they aged, uh, they aggregated and we tracked them with these buoys and we found these uh, absorbing features at 980 um, that were linked to the age of the seagrass, how old it was. We did a bunch of tank experiments. Um, so anyways, another feature that is in the near infrared that we're working towards. Um, and then this is just something else I was looking at in Long Island Sound and Colin. You guys worked on her inversion model, which is awesome. It's absorption and backscattering base, but in this case, these organisms, Mesodinium fluoresce yellow, which we saw as a little bump in the reflectance from a sensor called HICO, which was a hyperspectral sensor. Um, and so that would be something to augment Collins' code going forward and like put in fluorescence features as part of the backscattering. Um, because if you see something unique like this, you can be like, oh, either there was a pigment that absorbed right here or there was fluorescence that <laughs> happened here. So you have to kind of know what you're looking at. But uh, some of these things are uniquely identifying certain organisms. This is because of phycoerythrin, which is pretty bright. And we mapped it to the western part of beautiful Long Island Sound. So um, as I'm ending my talk soon, I want to say you guys can drive down and visit us at the end of the class. We're located about right here. Um, Jeremy did his master's there, and it is epic. Um, in any case, it makes really dense red waters, like the kind of red that you don't normally see. Even though it fluoresces yellow, um, it's creating a red tide of um, pretty dense because it's an animal. I love this story because this is seeing an animal from what we would call an animal. It's a ciliate that takes its cryptophyte phytoplankton and it throws the chloroplasts on its back and photosynthesizes. So, you know, there's all sorts of cool, groovy things out there that we're learning. Yes? Yep.
pretty good model, but what it doesn't fit, so what should you do? Throw it out in that <laughs> no, alien at file. Look at the residuals, right? If you look at the residuals between them and you see a really nice feature, then you think, well, is it in the positive or is it in the negative? Do I have too much absorption or do I have too much light? Right? So you can begin to then ask the question, like, is that a fluorescent signature? Right? And, and then you want to add it into your model. Yeah, and the funny thing is this four is uh, the absorption. So this actually, if it were truly, it would peak a little further this way, but because there's absorption, the actual residual peak is shifted slightly into the 570s, five, you know. So it's kind of an interesting mix. It's something we have to be aware of. Um, also, looking at algorithms where we have the steep red edge, which is a scattering signature with coupled with absorption by chlorophyll, which you guys know happens here. And sometimes it's fluorescence, and sometimes it, it's co-mingled uh, with this red edge of reflectance. Um, so it'll, if it's a near-surface bloom and the water hasn't absorbed, remember the water signature typically takes away the signature. But if these are surface blooms, so people looking at cyanobacteria in lakes, um, they can't do their standard atmospheric correction like Jeremy's going to show you um, because this gets removed as an aerosol um, or sea spray or something else. Um, so you have to actually be aware that if you're looking at signatures like this, you have to do your own atmospheric or just a Rayleigh correction. Um, and there's a lot of cool algorithms now on the steepness. If we had hyperspectral, uh, the shape, what's going on, fluorescence versus red edge, to detect different kinds of blooms. Sadly, we don't have a fluorescence on veers. Yeah? Oh, um, I was just curious. Uh, why is the medium chlorophyll A, cyanobacteria, why does it have more of a reflectance peak than uh, the low or the high chlorophyll? The low, high, and I... Oh, yeah. So why does the low have a higher? Well, it, it looks like the high quarter yeah. in, the, in the red series and the low in the black are both lower than the medium. It is a good point. That would be worth studying whether it was methodological and how. I didn't actually do these measurements. They came from, uh, I think, Tim Moore. Um, so maybe there's... Something funny about this one had more nodules with more scattering. It was a different surface, and maybe it was more near surface. There's a whole bunch of reasons. So sometimes they're slightly submerged and then it goes back down. Sometimes, if they're super emergent, then it's actually like land vegetation. So you do have to know how submerged and how dense and how much is right at the sea surface um, to be looking at this part, right? So, I mean, what, that's what I speculate in this case because it has a little less absorption here, but it looks sort of similar. It's a little more scattering in general, so I think it might have been more of a floating one. But that's a great question. And those are the kinds of things you have to start thinking about, that we as a community, you know, how do we do these things reliably? How do we do submerged, slightly submerged? What can we say? What, is, what do we want to say? Like, there's a red edge. So right now there's this maximum chlorophyll index, which is um, from Maris, and we'll have it on Old T. But our community has never said, we need a band here. In fact, so not, we didn't even get a band, a fluorescence band on um, beers. Right? So our follow-on ocean color doesn't do anything here. So we can't really do a lot of cool in-water work without these bands. But PACE will have bands all the way out. So, you know, can we come up with an algorithm that says this is a floating mat that's submerged, and this is a floating mat that's at the sea surface and very bright? Are there different manifestations like trichodesmium? That one was floating, obvious at the surface. Sargassum uh, and syringodium rack. So these are some of our measurements. You can start to see some features as well. 
So, um, you know, instead of throwing out these pixels or removing it with a white cap, we can start to triage and say, okay, this looks like it has a red edge. Let's throw that into a different atmospheric correction technique and see if we can't recover something from this pixel. or age, we did a study of kelp, and as they aged, so the kelp aged, the near-infrared went down because it scattered less. So there's a whole bunch of things that the terrestrial community know about the signature in plants. They've been evaluating it pretty well. But now that we're trying to do things and look at coastal waters and inland waters and waters that have unique signatures, you know, having this, this band is super important and we haven't put that on any of our follow-on sensors um, going forward so I would like to add to your point on that. so working on cyanobacteria we saw like 620 nanometer feature which is the like the most specific feature we see in the Mary's band or sentinel 3 you see so what we saw is like if there is higher concentration of cyanobacteria you will see the maximum absorption at 620, which we can see here, you know. If you look 620 nanometer, yeah. you can see the, you know, and all the comparison is like exact two readers. So, yeah, that's what we saw actually in our spectroscopy. But if you see like higher, you know, the red one is like absorbing the maximum and reflecting the maximum. And um, Mark Matthews has some algorithms that sometimes certain types of blooms show up. Fluorescence, sometimes that's repressed and you just get a red edge with cyanos. So um, you wouldn't even see it with fluorescence. And the funny th thing is we're looking at Long Island Sound and I was like, are we sure there's my postdoc Fernanda who works in Santa Barbara? And I said, I was like, are we sure there's a spring broom? And everyone looked at me like, I said, yeah, we just don't see it from Otis at all. We don't get any fluorescence. It's not there. And they're like, yes, there's a spring bloom. I'm like, okay, so let's, is there a problem with the in-situ data or is it the satellite? I'm like, the satellite, we're looking at red edge. We're looking at fluorescence. Why are we not seeing anything? And in the winter, it might be too dark for them to fluoresce. But then we went to Maris and we saw the red edge and we're like, oh my gosh, there's a red edge. There's just no fluorescence. And so we could see the spring bloom only with these, this channel. Um, so just there are areas where your satellite may have funny things and it might not fluoresce in the winter very much or those types of blooms get reabsorbed, the fluorescence. And so this part of the spectrum is worth some attention if you're looking at surface blooms. Yes, Kurt. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's worth actually sending some data to John Headley now that I yeah, think about it. All right, let's see what else I have in my exciting toolbox. Oh, and just finally, some shallow water stuff, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but um, we have instituted, and I know when you guys get the, oh, I'm just adding a bunch of stuff I don't want to add. Um, it's good to take a look. We're requiring the data for shallow water uh, follow this coastal and marine ecological classification standard. Uh, at least as closely as you can get it. So be 